I graduated from art college way back in 1988. I was in Bristol in England and um, I've pretty much stayed making art ever since then, which I've been very fortunate with. Um, my main area, I suppose, would be charcoal drawing. Um, I do painting as well, but um, I actually do a lot of charcoal drawing, mainly animals and life drawing. Um, and really, that's I work from home in a studio, and uh, I've been in Sligo for 21 years now, and uh, been working away really since the moment I got here. Um, the Korja exhibition for the Korja Festival, um, uh, I'm part of the, the kind of committee, if you like, um, that uh, we put the ideas together. And um, uh, really, the, the basis was to bring together eight, six, eight, ten. We kind of mulled over the numbers a few times, but a few artists locally, living locally, um, to present an exhibition for the Korja Arts Festival and uh, myself and Barra are curating the exhibition and also taking part. Um, so I was really delighted to get involved because, um, you know, one of my, um, I suppose, personal um, involvements or interests in it is that local artists to Sligo um, do get a chance to showcase their work and, I mean, this is the perfect platform to do it. The um, theme of the um, exhibition was an issue worth mentioning. Now, anybody that's living now on the planet, there are so many issues that really are worth mentioning. It was, it was quite difficult to try and hone it down, but in my own personal practice, I really enjoy drawing animals, and in particular, I enjoy drawing hares. So um, one of the things which um, I have has come to my notice fairly recently is that hair coursing seems to be um, a blood sport which is very much alive and well in Ireland and um, I chose this as my theme because uh, I think that um, the hair for me it's, it's, it's a totemic animal everybody has a totem and um, the hair is definitely mine and um, I wanted to first of all I wanted to make drawings of my favorite thing which is the hair, but also um, the, the idea of the hair coursing, I mean, it's difficult when you're, if you ever see any footage of it, it's really quite horrific. And I mean, the beauty and elegance of the hair is so much more than just this awful piece of prey that's being hunted down by these dogs. The, the odds are stacked against it. Unfortunately, um, there is practice now where hares are actually taken to islands and the dogs are, are set on there. So, I mean, they've actually no way of, of escaping. It is a complete blood sport, and it's something which I find utterly abhorrent, completely unnecessary. And I thought that if I used this platform to um, maybe highlight that issue, um, maybe somebody might think twice about it, and it might bring it back to the attention of the general populace. Um, it's, you know, it's also, of course, it's a, it's a great vehicle for me to be able to draw what I love drawing the most. And it's kind of ironic that the, um, the drawings that I've made of the hair, you know, I haven't put any dogs in those drawings because I don't want them part of it, even though the essence of the drawing is the hair running from the dog. So I've made two pictures like that, and then um, one which is slightly different. I um, read and write quite a lot of poetry. So I've used one of my own personal poems to make a piece of art as well. Um, I suppose one of the things that rules or kind of influences my work is the fact that I used to work in theatre and used to do set design and props and, and things like that. Um, and I suppose I have a background because of my father in theatre as well. Um, and because of that, I've always worked with interiors, either in a sculptural way or painting or photography, and quite often all three together. An issue worth mentioning can be anything, and I, I had a long list <laughs> that I could have responded to. Um, and it's as easy as it seems to stop wasting, it's not, because we, you know, not just because we live in a consumer society and we are. Uh, completely um, wound up in this idea of 
we need to produce and then to consume in order to even have an economy. You know, it's, it's, it's so integrated that it's not as simple as, okay, I stop buying or I just don't throw this away. My mother was cleaning, has been cleaning up or tidying up and throwing things out um, for the last three years since my father died. And, you know, as I said, I come from a long line of hoarders. So this is <laughs> something we talk about in terms of like, what do you hang on to and what do you throw away? What has had its use? And what is, um, what is ready for a new use or what can be used for something else or can, can you take apart and, and you know, we've all, we would have always done that. But I just I find it fascinating where you, yeah, where, where do you decide that something has had its time and, and kind of get rid of it, you know, so. I came across this little poil road which I'd made years ago um, and it's of a bin bag. And I kept it, I always kept it, uh, it's in, a little, in its own casing because it was the last point of, of that box. So the casing becomes the frame. Um, I suppose for me that image is about um, the fact that, you know, one man's rubbish is another man's treasure and the Polaroid being, you know, really hard to get now. It's becoming something really precious, something expensive, but it's so throwaway. It's so disposable um, and so instant, which is for me ties in with the idea of how we consume and how we uh, throw things away. So, in relation to that, is the fact that I did not want to use the kind of obvious um, waste material as the art in, in order to make that image. Not because I don't like it, because I use a lot of the, you know man, man made or found objects, but the, the issue itself is not that simple. Kind of, okay, well then we just use it again for something else because it, it just keeps growing anyway. So, so that's it. <laughs>
uh, climate change was becoming a big issue. It was coming out of conspiracy theory and into the mainstream media. And uh, having been raised on a farm, the weather was always a preoccupation throughout my life anyway. So I thought, what better way to put what I already had in terms of observational skills into my work. Um, and I've been painting ever since. I was delighted. I was delighted that my work would be in context for the first time. Um, so uh, that really spurred me on to uh, one, relook at and rethink what I was already doing in terms of the seascapes, the weather in particular. And uh, I looked more towards the landscape for this particular project to make it more localized rather than the general aspects of seascape and everything that can be projected onto that as an image. Um, so I looked more towards uh, local uh, landscape and the particular weather events we've had in the last couple of years. Spring in particular, um, which was so desolate this year, dry, the landscape was incredibly burnt out and I thought that would make just a wonderful visual um, representation of the time we're at now uh, in terms of climate change, environmental issues. So there's a whole range of thinking that goes behind the actual subject matter that you see within the painting itself. You can, given the history of landscape, you can project a multitude onto uh, a very small painting. Um, so I've used um, photographs for this particular um, body of work that I've produced. Um, I used, started with the 2010 winter, 16 below, temperatures that were unheard of at the time and uh, again the spring painting as well. I've also included uh, the sea as well in that particular uh, piece. Yeah, well I'm a painter uh, primarily and I just use, I suppose, the basics of um, art, uh, drawing, pencils, charcoals um, and oil paint, acrylic, squash, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much in the messy end of things, um, the creation end of things rather than the theory or the conceptual side of things and um, I've just been painting constantly. I've been painting now for probably over uh, 20 years. So uh, that's the kind of thing that excites me, using materials, using um, making something actually, physically making the painting in front of you. And I really am reflecting on the environment and um, I mean I go to places that are remote, are, are wild, or I, I seek out places that, are, that aren't spoiled, which is hard, a hard thing to do these days and harder and harder to do. And um, Somebody told me, why don't you paint the rubbish that you're tripping over when you go to these places? And I, I mean, I never, I mean, I don't do that. I photograph the places and it's all there, but um, they're changing, you know, landscapes are changing and they're being denuded and they're being de destroyed. Or, you know, you go to some places and they're constantly being interfered with. And that in itself is, 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 is probably uh, uh, as much as a statement as anything else. I don't consciously make statements in my work. The, uh, the painting I've chosen here is, um, I mean, it's based on a well, a hidden well near where I live, and I used to take my kids there, and, um, you know, I used to try and impress on them that this water has to be kept, you know, uh, at all times uh, uh, clear and fresh, and, I, you know, you try to do that Native American thing where you pass on to the kids, this is the simplicity of nature, we're all in a cycle, and if we destroy nature, we're going to destroy our own, our own you know, our own environment. So the, the idea that we, we went to the well and we, we collected this pu pure water and it was a kind of a hidden well, but we were all like uh, custodians of this well and we had to keep, keep it safe. Um, that tied in a lot with um, my own beliefs and uh, ideas. I, I actually had work in the studio that I felt related to the theme, that I, the theme of the environment or, or the uh, uh, my feelings about the environment and I've, uh, because I've just constantly been painting the landscape all the time um, I just felt that they, they tied in um, as I said Path of the Well was was uh, was the first one I, I chose I just felt that this was so um, uh, you know it, it was symbolic of what I of my beliefs about how we treat the environment and how we relate to the environment around us I suppose in the political sphere I'd be concerned about the fracking uh, 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 companies that are threatening to come into the northwest of Ireland around the border area and the whole concern there amongst the communities, the farming communities in particular, is that they would destroy the water supply, which is of course, you know, a deeply 
almost like a sacred thing in all societies and cultures, but particularly in Ireland where the wells were, you know, they were like holy sites and they were sacred sites. So this notion that the water table would be disturbed or polluted is, is, a, is a deep, deep thing in a, in a society which is rural and, um, you know, needs its water supply. Also relying on tourism and relying on the idea that this is an unspoilt landscape and if we destroy that, I mean, I, we, we technically don't, we, we don't have anything really. And we know what happens when uh, when uh, profits govern um, a society, as we saw in the last decades. You know, there was wholesale destruction, overbuilding, etc., etc. So we don't. Want, I mean, it's just something I would be very wary of. And again, the painting is 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 again a quiet kind of. It's not a p obvious political statement, but it is a personal statement. Um, as I say, a snapshot of time. Me, based on me, this 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 well that we used to go to for water, and uh, the idea that. I was, you know, trying to get tell my kids that we have to respect these places and we have to continue this, uh, I suppose, protection of them. And uh, if they can, if they can inherit that and maybe pass that on to their kids, then uh, you know you feel you've you've done something positive. I moved to Ireland in the mid '90s. For the last three years, I've been working, uh, practicing here from the model studios. And um, my work has kind of diverged quite a lot. So it would, it would go across disciplines. So it would, um, I'd be using drawing, printmaking, photography. More recently, I've been using sound and it would kind of go into 3D and installation. Um, in terms of the kind of subject matter or themes I work on, it's again, it's fairly broad and would tend to go off in different directions. But um, essentially, um, I think it's about how we all kind of negotiate our lives and um, it's, it's quite often in direct response to um, personal experience and the experience of people around me. Uh, firstly, I thought it was um, great that the festival orga organisers had um, thought about giving a platform for people to actually respond things that they, they really cared about or were concerned about because uh, I think particularly in this climate with cuts across all services it's really important that people are able to voice um, things that they are worried about. I didn't specifically make work for this I think this is a continuation of work that I've been doing since about 2009. It's, it started with a body of work called the obsessive compulsive drawings and um, it was in direct response to um, something that was going on in my own family circum circumstances. And um, so the, the issue that I decided that I wanted to uh, bring awareness to in this particular um, exhibition is um, child and adolescent, adolescent mental health. I suppose because of my situation I've had direct experience of the facilities that are available here in Sligo and um, on the one hand you have uh, the people on the ground who are working as an incredibly fantastic team of practitioners and professionals who are working within the mental health service particularly with young people and adolescents and um, probably not very many people know but there's a place down the road off the Mal called uh, Molloy House which is a child and family mental health centre and they offer just the most fantastic service. So I suppose I wanted to highlight the service that is, that is there, the, the fantastic people that are working there, but also the difficulties that they are increasingly facing in providing that level of service. Um, uh, so the two particular pieces of work that I'm presenting, um, one, is, one is called um, half full, half empty, and um, it's essentially three, three beakers, which have, uh, they're half full of, of wax, actually. There is a text on them. Um, so I suppose for me that is about how easy it is for us all to slip between the one and the other. You know, depending on what's going on in our lives or external circumstances or whatever, how easily it is to move from a situation where you are quite happy with your life to a point where, it, where, where you can actually um, fall into some kind of crisis. So that is, that is one, one part of the work. The other part of the work um, is called Possibilities, 
and um, it, it's a big pile of wishbones which are housed in a glass container and it's not so much about wishing, wishing on a star, but more about um, the possibilities that are open in terms of, you know, maybe accessing help when you need it and that um, through intervention from professionals and, and practitioners there are, there are lots of possibilities and opportunities to move your life forward. So I suppose it's those two sides to the work and I would see the two pieces as um, being kind of counterpoints to each other. I've got no training. I didn't go to art school. Um, and I didn't grow up in a family that was all artistic. My wife did, but I didn't. Uh, it wasn't discouraged in my family. It was just not even a thing. So I, didn't, I came from a very kind of working class background and there was no way I'd be able to go to art college. It was like financially just non... It would be just a non-starter. When I was 16, I, left, I, I went to work. Um, and did metal work. My dad was a welder, my son was my brother. So I got into metal work, but then just all the welding and grinding just used to bore me. And so it wasn't until I moved to Ireland that I got into forge work. And then it was just like an explosion. It was like unbelievable, where all of a sudden all that creativity had bottled up for how many years doing crappy jobs. And then you just couldn't, it was, you couldn't turn it off then. It was impossible to turn it off. And so that's kind of my background, is I'm pretty much 99% self-taught, apart from the year that I worked with Brian Halvin. I'm lucky that because of my portfolio now, customers very rarely ask to see drawings or anything like that, so I can give them an idea and then just go and create, you know. And so I don't like to draw my work because I think my medium is hot forged still, which is different to drawing something and then making, then you're forging something to a to a different medium, do you know? Um, and so 90% of my work or 99% of my work is just hot forged steel. Um, I do, I have used other materials like bronze and copper and silver in my work. But most of the time it's, I'm, I'm in love with, with forged metal. It's, it's just the most beautiful thing in the world to me. It's what blacksmiths term, in a blacksmith's term they call it the black look. There's blacksmiths that are in love with making stuff. Some people are in love with the process and some people are actually in love with the material. And I very quickly, within days of working with Brian, fell in love with the texture you get when you, there's a, there's a way of forging metal where the surface is just gorgeous, it's beautiful. When it's still hot, but it's lost color and you've forged it in one heat and there's a luster that comes across the metal, which is really addictive. And you're always, I'm, well, I'm always trying to capture that in my work. Or, like, that's the thing, if I can get that. And sometimes, because of the process, you have to heat it five or six times. And each time you heat it, you lose a bit of that. And so it's kind of like, it's, it's like alchemy comes from the forge. And that's the alchemy of forge work, is trying to, for me, trying to put, get that into my work. So the faster you can work, the better. But because your work gets more elaborate over time, and, it becomes impossible sometimes. I am very opinionated, which most people know me know, and I have strong feelings. But the other side of that is, I want my work to portray that. So I don't give mission statements, and I don't explain my work. For me, that is the exciting thing about art. And so I see it as my job that I portray my feelings and emotions that I'm working into my work, especially my sculptural work, what I call my, my speculative sculpture work, which is stuff that I make for myself that isn't made for a commission or for a, for a customer or a public piece of work. I'm portraying my feelings about whatever I'm feeling at the time, or there might be a, a subject that I'm really concentrating on and that's what it will be about. The other thing I try to do in my work is get people to touch it because it's robust work, it's not going to break. I love it when people can't help themselves but, but to feel it and touch it. Before I was, a lot of my work was in response to environment and this latest series of work is really about getting my frustrations out into physical form to really stop myself 
going mad with all these kind of ideas and emotions about what it's, you know, the day-to-day -day struggles since the recession and the, the craziness of everything. And especially, I'm sure it's the same, I don't know what it's like in the recession to, to work doing a nine-to-five job, so I wouldn't know, but the, of being a full-time artist and having to survive in the current climate and all of the crazy things that go along with that. So each piece is response of that. The two, the, the, the two major pieces, the, the gift and um, Black Wave, are kind of that kind of response to my emotional state more than anything else, I suppose. But other than that, I won't say anymore. Well, I'm originally from Dublin, um, moved here to Sligo about a decade ago. Never went to conventional college. I could consider myself predominantly self-taught as an artist, but I did do some skill-based courses, very valuable skill-based courses. Um, I love it here in Sligo, and I uh, can't imagine living anywhere else really. Uh, it's got everything I want and need. I guess as an artist, I, I work on all sorts of materials. Um, I think my favourite would be ceramics. I tend to go back to them again and again and again. But I work in mixed media, found objects, I weld, I cast, I, I work in everything I carve. Um, and that's pretty much my background. I, I, my ideas come from all over the place. Uh, it could be a scribble on a paper, a bit of a doodle in a sketch pad, or something I read would trigger off an idea. So uh, sometimes the uh, sculpture kind of comes forth through form or colour or texture, and then the kind of concept or idea kind of develops from that, and sometimes it's the other way around. I'm one of the co-organisers of this exhibition uh, along with uh, Tara McGowan and Heidi Wickham and uh, together we were basically working on this. It was Tara's idea to, to have a theme to the show and she wanted it to be uh, about people's issues. She wanted people to talk about their issues and um, it was I Heidi's idea to film artists and put it in the actual show and um, get the art artists to respond to uh, the, the team and uh, an issue worth mentioning is the team and the title of the show and uh, we, we thought it'd be interesting for artists to well if they're not used to working on issues or themes like this it's interesting it's challenging for them and they might come up with something they normally wouldn't the work I made for the show, uh, I made, I'm making two pieces, I have to say they're not actually finished yet. W one of them is about uh, overfishing, uh, the over it's, it's a global problem, uh, it's a big problem and it's a big threat to a lot of ecosystems and, and the environment. Um, it's not too late to change that and it can be actually still saved uh, as a problem and uh, well this piece is kind of just addressing that it's just in a kind of a comical way uh, it's, a, it's a guy sitting in a boat uh, on his own with a fishing rod and he's really having a great day because he his fish is he's, fi he's fished so much that uh, it's tilting the boat it's, it's weighing the boat down and he's popped up and um, it's just saying Bit, it, it's a bit greedy, we don't need to take that much fish and we need to think about what fish we're taking and where we're taking them from. And the second piece is, it's about the fat cat sitting on top and everyone below him, he's sitting up on his throne and everyone else is basically sheep, sheeple, with their eyes closed, great, happily grazing away, oblivious to the bigger picture, I think. It's, it's basically um, talking about how this, this has always been like this. I mean, there's been royalty, there's been ch the church, there's been huge businessmen and companies all the time, and they always are 
the fat cat on top. There's nothing new about this. It's always been like that and it always probably will be like that. So in that way, I don't think it's really an issue as in something that can be changed. It's, it's kind of always gonna be like that.